Well, after a judge ruled that a Six Nations family had the right to terminate their 11-year-old daughter's chemotherapy treatments, preferring to treat her leukemia with traditional medicine, many in the medical and legal communities were taken by surprise. So joining us now for more on the decision, Grant Huscroft, constitutional law professor at London's Western University, and Janet Smiley, a family doctor who directs the Well Living House Indigenous Research Centre at St. Michael's Hospital. Welcome to you both. Um, Janet, let me just begin with you. Let's just take a step back. Just remind us uh, about the basics of this case. Okay, so what happened is this 11-year-old girl became ill at home in August. Um, her mother thought that she perhaps had pneumonia and took her to the hospital. Um, and at that time, it was um, identified that she had um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, so she was admitted to the hospital and started chemotherapy. Um, after about 10 days of the chemotherapy, um, the family that had always felt conflicted about the chemotherapy compared to their faith um, in the traditional healing and medicines that are available to them in their home community, um, and also in response to the acute pain um, that JJ, this 11-year-old girl, was experiencing, um, decided um, that they would like to discontinue the treatment in the hospital. Um, so they left the hospital at that time so that they could pursue more holistic um, treatment, including the traditional healing therapies that are available to them. Okay, and then fast forward and the, the, the hospital asks for the child to be taken, put into protective custody. This goes to, uh, to court and the ruling comes out uh, recently, you know, about a week and a half ago, that JJ is not going to be forced to take the chemotherapy or be taken away from her family and can um, pursue the traditional means that she so wants to do. That's right. You met JJ um, these last couple of days yeah. since this court ruling. How's she doing? Um, she looked great. Um, so um, she very bravely um, sat on a panel um, with her mother at the end of an Indigenous health conference um, and then we um, were able to ask questions um, and uh, yeah she um, was um, sitting maturely through these very serious discussions, um, was very kind to me when I introduced myself just briefly and told her, hey, what do you think? The media is calling me to comment on this case. Um, she looked well, um, and in some ways she looked like a regular 11-year-old girl. And here we are asking you to comment on this case. Should you give me any advice? Um, well, I think in particular there was um, support for the notion that we do need to be very careful um, when we engage in discussions and media discussions um, around issues that involve the health and well-being, um, particularly of children. So um, there has been some media coverage which I think has um, had some negative impact on the family um, statements like she looked illness stricken. Imagine if you're the child reading this mm -hmm. um, in the paper. Um, so I guess as we talk about these ethical issues, um, everybody um, is engaging in this discussion because they want the best um, for JJ with respect to her health and well-being. I do think is important for us to think about, um, ironically, how these discussions could negatively impact JJ. I think it's an important point to remember, though, that I think on mass everyone's trying to work from, from where they see this uh, in the best interests of, of this child, no matter where they come down on this one. Grant, let me bring you in. Um, as a constitutional lawyer, talk to me about the, the judge's decision and, and what, what you see into that. Well, the judge, uh, first of all, in the normal circumstance, this wouldn't have been a constitutional issue. So we've got a law of general application um, about protecting children's welfare, basically. And the doctors formed the view that the children the child, uh, JJ, was in need of protection. So that's a standard case to that point. Uh, reported, doctor reported uh, to the uh, children's aid. Children's aid didn't take the action. So the action ends up in court in an odd kind of way with the hospital actually bringing it, seeking to get the, uh, the child taken into custody for treatment, basically. So that's not unusual. We've seen that before with Jehovah's Witnesses sure. refusing blood transfusions in, in that kind of context. Um, what's different in this case is that once it got to court, it became an Aboriginal rights uh, issue. And so the judge makes a basically a constitutional law decision on a, what otherwise would be a, a health law matter, and that's what makes this quite unusual. So in principle, these are completely different because you raise the the issue of you know Jehovah's Witnesses who often don't want their children to have blood transfusions, and that is you see this, it's very different when we're talking about this case 
compared to those kinds of cases? Well, no, it's, the, what we've got is conflicting rights and, and, and interests here. We've got this interest of the state in, in uh, looking after children and acting in their best interests, making sure that they get medical treatment that they need on the one hand. On the other hand, with the Jehovah's cases, we have people exercising a uh, claim of religious freedom under the Charter of Rights. So that's a constitutional claim too. Um, the courts have had no trouble with that case, saying that, that your, your right is reasonably limited and, and, and treatment is, is the order if that's in the best interest of the child normally. Um, here though we've got a different outcome. What we've got is uh, an Aboriginal right asserted and the judge uh, treated that, that right as an absolute basically and did not consider, and this is an error in my view, uh, I don't even think it's arguable actually, I think, I think most analysis I think that you'll see on this will say the judge erred in wrongly in, in failing to take into account whether the right that he identified was reasonably limited by this law of general application. So Explain that to me, that's legalese for me. Well, the judge uh, identified an Aboriginal right, and so the analysis goes like this. The judge concludes that um, uh, treatment with traditional medicine practices uh, is an integral part of the culture of the, uh, the, the claimant band in this case. That that right is protected not under the Charter, but under another provision of the Constitution. But Aboriginal rights aren't protected absolutely. They're always subject to limitations. So in the normal course, you would have, uh, for example, a right might be recognized to a cultural practice or hunting or fishing. That right would still be subject to reasonable regulations by the state, but it wouldn't be able to wipe out the right. They would have okay. to coexist to some extent. The judge hasn't done that kind of a balancing. The judge has said only that there's an Aboriginal right here and therefore we're done. And that, that I think is a mistake. Okay. You want to say something? You do. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's interesting because um, as Indigenous scholars um, working in the area of health, um, there's actually a literature around the sovereign right to um, deciding on your own health care treatment. So the one um, point I'd like to make, though, is if the judge is recognizing the pre-constitutional and inherent rights of Indigenous people, so when there are legal scholars like uh, Dr. Yvonne Boye who have extended that right um, to the right to choose your own health care treatment, um, in order to um, limit that right, um, one would have to assume that the inherent rights and in indigenous civilizations don't actually have their own mechanisms built in to protect the child. So for myself, I have no problem, um, and particularly having met JJ and her mother, um, they're amazing leaders and role models, and I have um, absolute confidence um, in the ability of JJ's mother um, to take care of her and to provide for her. Um, and all of that happens um, within her way of um, being an Indigenous Haudenosaunee woman. And she actually made a very articulate um, argument and presentation of that when I was able to meet and chat with her. You know, th this, uh, it's more than a story, it's, a, it's about a young girl and, and her life and her, her beliefs and her family's beliefs, but it exists on so many planes. So one is a legal arena where we've had a, a ruling. The other is um, about what is medicine and, and the value of scientific medicine versus traditional practices. So I want to read something. This is uh, written by Terry Glavin, journalist at the Ottawa Citizen. This is uh, back in November 19th. It's quite long, so just bear with me. Here's what Terry wrote. JJ's mother pulled her out of the hospital anyway and brought her to something called the Hippocrates Health Institute of West Palm Beach, Florida, where for a fee of $18,000, cancer patients are treated with naturopathic massage, ionic foot baths, and aromatherapy. You don't need to be a judge, Terry writes, a doctor or an anthropologist to suspect that hocus pocus is being passed off as some kind of augmented Six Nations medical tradition here. First Nations have not fought their way through the courts of this country to exercise their constitutional rights in a way, quote, which harms people Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal or to establish legally enforceable entitlements to substitute Floridian wheat, grass, enemas for the medical procedures necessary to save the lives of their kids. Okay, Janet, Terry Glavin you know, not mincing his words, you're trained in Western medicine. Are you worried about the treatment that JJ rece received instead of finishing her chemotherapy? But what that doesn't acknowledge or recognize, which is actually unfortunately quite typical of the way that Indigenous um, ways of health and healing have been marginalized and are still marginalized, is that at the same time as she was undergoing those alternative therapies, JJ was accessing traditional Haudenosaunee healing and medicines from very well. Can you explain what very some of those well, might be? Because I don't think most of us know what kind of practices those would be. Well, 
um, the community that JJ is from is quite fortunate that they have some very highly qualified traditional healers who have been able to hang on over multiple generations to their healing practices and ceremonies. Um, these things um, are things that can be closely guarded um, by the communities. So um, I didn't ask, and it may not have been appropriate for me to ask as a Cree Métis woman specifically um, what um, those healing um, treatments were, um, but I um, understand that they involve um, plant medicines and ceremonies. It's very hard actually to describe those, like uh, two people that are trained in biomedicine. One of the problems I think here is that people are um, making an assumption that there would be zero efficacy, right, of those um, traditional healing practices and medicines. And in fact, if one looks at the expanded literature around like responding more holistically to cancer, um, there's lots of mainstream physicians and surgeons who have talked about the shortcoming of biomedicine in that regard. I guess the other thing that um, I'm disappointed in a little bit is that this has been presented as an all or nothing, right? And it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. So for myself, my biggest concern um, when I interact um, with my patients, and I need mm -hmm. to clarify, I am not um, JJ's physician, um, but merely um, somebody who has been able to make a brief acquaintance with her, um, is to make sure that um, I'm laying out what is available honestly and humbly from biomedicine, noting its limitations. Biomedicine, you mean scientific medical. That's what we correct. Practice yes. in hospitals. Yeah. That's okay. right. But um, you know, people say there's a 95% cure rate. In fact, the cure rates um, with chemotherapy to ALL run from 30 to 95%, with the average being 90%. And I'm not. Um, I haven't had access. I'm not privy to the particulars of JJ's lymphoma mm. um, to understand. Um, but the other thing is there's side effects. And then the other thing is she did partially complete the course, right? So there seems to be this assumption that her life is threatened by removing her partway through her course of chemotherapy and accessing this traditional healing. Mm. Um, I guess the other issues um, and imperfections with mainstream medical approaches to healing childhood leukemia are the immediate consequences of the chemotherapy. Like JJ was in acute pain um, that wasn't um, getting attended to when the decision was made um, for her to leave the hospital. Um, and then as well, the long-term consequences. So we know in following um, people over the longer term childhood survivors of leukemia that there are some long term um, consequences of the chemotherapy mm -hmm. as well. So, I mean, I try to present honestly, of course, I'm trained in biomedicine. I think chemotherapy is a very useful tool um, for cancers in different contexts. But again, I'm a researcher, so I'll apply that lens and mm -hmm. want to understand and communicate specifically how effective it would be in this case. Grant, let me come to you. I mean, look, at the end of the day, everyone wants this girl to, to beat her leukemia. That, that's the goal for everyone. There is this discussion, though, that this case has now set a precedent, that it is going to change how we judge these in, in our courts of, of law. What kind of legal impact do you think this ruling might have? Well, I hope this is not a precedent. Uh, th th this is a badly decided case as a matter of constitutional law. Uh, I'm not in a position to discuss the medical sure. efficacy of any of the treatments, but I will say this. I mean, this case comes up because the oncologist treating uh, JJ reports that she's going to die without this treatment and has a 90% chance. That's her report to the Children's Aid Society in identifying JJ as a, children in need, a child in need of uh, intervention. That's how this comes up. So I'm just going to take that as the given. Um, this is not a precedent to say that Aboriginal persons are exempt from child and family protection laws. It can't be. Uh, this is a decision of the lowest level of court in the province. Um, it probably, it, it, this is an example of, of how bad constitutional law is in dealing with some things like this, frankly. Um, you don't want constitutional law deciding medical issues, it seems to me. Um, constitutional uh, Aboriginal rights cases take years normally mm -hmm. to look into the native practices, the, the extent to which they are protected and not. This was done very quickly, as quickly as possible because it was an urgent circumstances application. Sure. So it's the worst circumstances in which to, to think that a precedent would be created that, that goes beyond this case. This case uh, may or may not be appealed, but even if it's not appealed, it's creating no precedent because it's the lowest level of court. 
So it's not binding anything in that regard. You know, our time always flies by when we're talking about this. We actually only have about a minute or two left. But Janet, I want to ask you, you know, the hospital, McMaster has since said that they will respect um, the mother's wishes to use traditional Aboriginal healing as long as they can also treat JJ with chemotherapy. You've talked to this family. Do you think um, her mom's going to let her go back to the hospital? I think this family hasn't ruled out a collaborative relationship with medical doctors and oncologists. Um, I think any of the viewers would be hard put to go back to a healthcare institution or a physician that had actually served legal papers. So I think that there was a frank discussion by the physician saying that they would be calling Child Protection Agency and the mom understood the need to do that. Mm. But there was never a frank discussion saying that legal papers would be served. So. Um, I think that any of the viewers could understand why um, the they might is be looking elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. I tend to not go back to people that serve me legal papers for um, my health care. Mm -hmm. I would just say this. I, I want to repeat this. That, you know, we just wish the best for this young girl and for her family to get healthy. We hope that happens. We'll see what happens. Thank you both. Thank you. Janet Smiley from Grant House Croft. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.